Well, a warm welcome to this talk. Now, I want to look today at a study which demonstrates negative efficacy of ongoing COVID vaccination. And this study from Japan shows that people who were vaccinated are up to or sometimes more than twice as likely to become infected with COVID-19. Now, module four of the COVID inquiry in the UK has just started. I, I don't think they'll be including this study or probably indeed the Cleveland study that we've looked at before. But let's look at it. It's really interesting as we wait for changes to data releases in the United States. We are not expecting any changes to data releases in the United Kingdom at all. Quite the contrary, in fact. But in the United States, we're really hoping for this data to be released maybe in just in the next week or two, as soon as the new administration's in. Anyway, let's stick to the facts that we know today for, the, uh, for this particular study from Japan. Again, why is it that this study is being done in Japan? Why can the Japanese be asking questions that we're not allowed to ask? All, all, all very uncomfortable, it has to be said. Anyway, this study here, um, Behavioural and Health Outcomes of mRNA COVID Vaccine, a case control study in uh, Japanese small, medium-sized enterprises. So this is a, a data collected throughout Japan on uh, different demographics, different ages and, and sexes of people. Smaller scale than we would like, of course, but as we say, we're hoping for studies with tens of millions in soon that I strongly suspect is going to verify these type of findings. But of course, we don't know that till it comes out. This is why it's uh, an interesting time. Now, this was published uh, just, just last, uh, last month, December 2024. Understanding the impact of messenger RNA, mRNA, COVID vaccine uh, to urgently evaluate the effects. So these researchers are publishing now because they see a degree of urgency. We need to have ongoing views, reviews of what the heck we are doing. And uh, many of us are dissatisfied with the level of ongoing reviews of, of what we are doing. Um, now, they want to look at COVID infection rates and they also look at behavioural changes as well, which we'll come on to. Now, the, uh, they actually ended up getting data from 913 participants. The adjusted odds ratio for COVID-19 infection, <coughs> excuse me, still recovering from my infection. Adjusted odds ratio of, uh, uh, in, in, sorry, adjusted odds ratio for COVID-19 infection amongst vaccinated individuals compared to unvaccinated individuals. So very straightforward, they compared infections in vaccinated, infections in unvaccinated. Couldn't really be more straightforward. And they did a fairly rigorous uh, statistical analysis as well. And uh, here, here's the first result here, uh, 1.85. So uh, basically people that were vaccinated overall are 84%, 85% more likely to become infected with COVID. Now, of course, we know the whole string of adverse reactions that we're now aware of for the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. And you might somehow think you could justify some of the adverse reactions, although the adverse reactions have been so severe in many, I don't think we can justify it, even if the efficacy was really high and even if the protection against extreme disease was really strong. But here we see it's simply not protecting against disease. It's making you 85% more likely to get disease. So... If you came to me as your healthcare provider and I said, look, I've got this injection here. It's got a whole range of possible adverse events. Uh, no, fair enough, I might get $20 for giving it, which, which is good. Um, but, but it's going to make you 85% more likely to catch the infection it's purportedly protecting you against. I mean, th th we're into the realms, realms of nonsense and absurdity here. And yet this is what the data shows. This is what it clearly shows. Um, and the P there is, a, so, so that, that first one would be one in 10, that would be one in 100, one in 1,000. So the odds of this happening uh, by chance are, are one in 1,000. Um, this is not a chance finding odds. It's, there's 999 times out of 1,000, to be sure. It's not a false uh, finding. So there we go. Very simple data from this study. A higher percentage of participants who contracted COVID-19 had received at least one dose of the vaccine. Odds of contracting COVID-19 vaccines increased with the number of doses. So <coughs> people who had had um, one dose of the vaccine were more likely to get a contract COVID-19, more likely to get the infection. And as the doses went up, 
the probability of getting the infection increased. <laughs> it's utterly, utterly bizarre. It's the antithesis of what is purported to be the, uh, the, the benefit of protecting us. And of course, the whole reason that we were given these vaccines in the first place was the original studies uh, purported to show protection against becoming infected. So why aren't, why aren't we taking cognizance of this ongoing data? Why aren't regulators saying, oh, heck, 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 there's a study in Japan, in Japan showing that more vaccines are, are showing that you might get more infections. Analyze our data and let's prove this is wrong quickly. That would be the obvious thing to do. Unless, of course, it's right. In which case, they should still do it. But they don't seem to be. You might have your reasons as to why that might B, or your suspicions. Now, if you'd had one or two doses, uh, 63%, odds ratio 1.63. Now, the p-value there didn't reach significance, but I suspect it would um, if there was higher numbers. In fact, I'm pretty sure it would have been higher numbers. Uh, three, or, three to four vaccines are uh, more, more than twice as likely to get the infection. And uh, five to seven doses uh, were well over twice as likely to get the infection. Behaviour analysis indicated that a reduced frequency of bathing and exercise, this is at the next point, was significantly associated with higher COVID-19 infection rates. In other words, they showed that bathing, which Japanese culture, of course, and exercise are actually, appear to be protective. Why aren't we hearing more about lifestyle factors? Why is it jab, 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 jab? Why not vitamin D? Why not nutrition? Why not protein? Why not vitamin C? Why not exercise? Why not all the other things that promote an active immune system that we never seem to hear of from our regulatory authorities? But to be clear, that's the data there. Um, the more vaccine doses you have, the more likely you are to contract the infection. Right, right the conclusions... Um, the conclusions that they come to, the study observed a higher reported instance of COVID infection amongst vaccinated individuals during the pandemic period. So this data was actually collected up until the end of 2023, I think. But there's no reason to suspect it's not applicable to current times as well. Now, this paradoxical finding may be influenced by various factors. Now, we have looked at this quite extensively, including uh, immune response mechanisms we've looked at, increasing T-cell suppressor, regulatory T-cell activity. <coughs> so what could be happening here is that the vaccines are increasing the activity of the T-suppressor or the T-regulatory lymphocytes. And these tend to damp down the immune response. Now, they don't know that the study didn't include this sort of pathophysiological analysis, but this is included as a possible mechanism. So the point is there's plausible mechanisms as to why uh, this could be happening in terms of uh, physiology. Antibody depend, uh, dependent enhancement means that the antibodies, basically this means that if the antibodies are present, the virus is more likely to get into cells. Of course, viruses reproduce inside cells. They are obligate intracellular parasites. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is rather rather interesting phrase, uh, acute uh, original antigenic sin and behavioral changes. Now, um, this original antigenic sin is sometimes called uh, immune imprinting. And we've, looked, we've covered this extensively with Professor Clancy, so I'm not going to go into too much detail now. But basically, it's immune imprinting. So you, you, you're exposed to a particular antigen. In this case, it would be the virus. And then, uh, sorry, the vaccine, the vaccine. And then the virus comes along, which is similar, but the immune system's kind of fixated on the original um, antigen, vi vaccine antigen that, that, that it was exposed to. It kind of takes away the flexibility of it. But as I say, we've done more on that in, in detail before. Um, the, this idea of original antigenic sin. And of course, the reason this would happen is when you give the vaccine dose, you're giving it to a strain that was developed, a strain of the virus from, from the past, uh, at best at the time that you develop, the vaccine is developed. But then, of course, the, the, the virus keeps mutating. <laughs> this study actually says uh, up, up until, I think, the end of 2023, there was 10 waves with genetic variations of the, the virus. So um, it's going to be out of date by, by definition, um, when, the, when the vaccine is used. 
So uh, understanding these factors, uh, behavioural change they talked about as well in exposure risk. Now, it could be, it could be as simple as the fact that people who've had vaccine think, oh, I'm all right now, and go and take part in more risky behaviours. It could be that simple, but they don't think that is the case. While the researchers couldn't disprove that because of the scale of the study, they don't believe it to be the case, and I don't believe it to be the case either. I think it's based on these immunological, pathophysiological mechanisms that are well known. We've done this for decades in, for, in terms of desensitising vaccines. If someone's allergic to peanuts, you can reduce that by giving desensitised vaccines by increasing various things in the immune system. For example, the number of T regulatory suppressor cells. Now, um, the researchers say there's an urgent... Uh, it's an urgent, understand, understanding these factors is crucial for urgent enhance, enhancing public health strategies and vaccination programs. Now, I forgot to make this big. Let's just see if I can enlarge this. This is the, uh, this is the uh, author studies here, the, the people in the study. It doesn't seem to want to go bigger for some reason. It, I was just showing you here that the authors are, oh, there we go. This just shows that the authors are all from uh, Japan and where they work in Japan. So recognised medical researchers in Japan from the paper there. Now, brief, I'm not going to go too much into the methods, but it was a case-controlled study, vaccinated v unvaccinated. Uh, data was collected up till the end of 2023. Survey gathered information on demographics, age and sex, COVID vaccine infection status, vaccine history, health status before January 2020. Uh, various preventative behaviours and the primary outcome was simply the absence or the presence of COVID-19 infection. And uh, they did use quite a sophisticated um, statistical analysis to get their data. Now, <coughs> this reminded me, excuse me again, this reminded me of the, um, the Cleveland study clinics, uh, the Cleveland clinic studies that came out. This one, for example, was when I realised that the risk-benefit analysis was no longer in favour of vaccine. Towards the end of 2021, this came out. I was aware of where, where more and more side effects of the vaccine, um, aware of the lack of efficacy of the vaccine, and I became convinced that the risk-benefit analysis has changed. And I was really, really annoyed because it was about a week after I'd had the third, my third dose of the... Uh, I, had a, I had a Moderna, unfortunately. And as I say, we've talked about this before. I believe I wasn't given informed consent. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the way that was. But th this came out at the end of 2021. Healthcare workers, 1,359 unvaccinated who previously tested positive. <coughs> and in the course of the study, none got infected. The study authors concluded individuals who have had SARS coronavirus 2 infection are unlikely to benefit from COVID-19 vaccination. And as I say, I realised that at the end of 2021. Wish I'd realised it sooner, but we're now in 2025 and the regulatory authorities still don't seem to have realised it, which is surprising. So there we go, uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal, evidence of negative vaccine efficacy, COVID vaccines increasing the risk of COVID infections. You really couldn't make it up. And yet we are where we are. But I'm hopeful for data from the United States. I'm hopeful for change in the United States. Pity about my country. As always, thank you for watching.